Okay. Well, I hope that that was uh, interesting. <laughs> it was very telling. Um, well, uh, I've misplaced my script. This happened again. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. I, I can. Um, Sure. Oh, I took it. I see you took it. Okay. Thank you. All right. Now, um, let's consider that a kind of um, prep, historical preface. Okay. It's enough to en enable us to observe that until the last couple of years, uh, propaganda has been notable as a kind of episodic phenomenon. You know, if we think back on the most notorious moments of propaganda in modern history since World War I, thanks, and we, we tend to think of certain propaganda episodes. So we think of uh, World War I, right? We think of the drive to demonize the German people. We think of the Nazis and their 12-year Reich and all the propaganda they used. We think of the Bolsheviks, we think of the Russian Revolution. Uh, we think of the Kennedy assassination and the narrative over that. We think of 9-11. So we think of these explosive episodes. But what we've been living through for the last two plus years is rather different because it has been a continuous rolling thunder of propaganda. Nor is it only national or regional, but it has been global. This is new. Never seen this before. I mean, I thought I'd seen everything, right? But I've never seen anything like this. We have a global propaganda drive and a continuous series of propaganda jolts, you see. So we could talk about COVID, for example, from the moment of its rollout in early 2020. Uh, we can talk about the fact that the Chinese media or some Chinese entity uh, circulated these videos of people dropping dead in the streets. Do you remember this? Mm -hmm. Which people never actually did once COVID struck, whatever COVID is. Uh, people weren't dropping dead in the streets ever. But there were these strange videos that seemed to come from China and people just kind of, you know, keeling over. You know, sometimes stopping their fall with their hands. It wasn't always that convincing. But the, the interesting thing about it was that the British tabloid press simultaneously picked up those videos and front page them. So this wasn't just something China was doing. This is something China and the West, right? and hyphenate those words, China and the West. They collaborated on this scare campaign, which then combined with the computer models out of Imperial College London and the University of Washington, both models funded by Bill Gates, both of which radically exaggerated the likely toll of this new virus. Then we were told two weeks to flatten the curve, Stay home for a couple of weeks, wear your masks, right? Although Bill, uh, Dr. Fauci did say on 60 Minutes, he had a national audience, masks don't actually stop the transmission of respiratory viruses. But then a couple of months later, yeah, they do. <laughs> you better wear them. You better, yeah, yeah, yes. After the head of the Chinese CDC, Dr. George Gao, said, you got to wear a mask. Everybody's got to wear a mask. The West isn't wearing its masks. Why aren't they wearing their masks? And Fauci said, you got to wear your mask. And everybody was saying, you got to wear your mask. you got to wear the mask. If you don't wear your mask, you're, you're a criminal, you're reckless, you're a Trump supporter, you're horrible, you're bad. <laughs> well, we, we're living under, a, a, as I say, conditions of rolling thunder. This is new. I mean, I could go through the last couple of years and delineate the different chapters of propaganda. There was the virus rollout in 2020 and the masking campaign. Then in the summer of 2020, there was the George Floyd moment and Black Lives Matter and Antifa 
and the destruction of American cities that weren't actually destroyed, because that was just the Trumpist lie, and all those buildings weren't actually burning, right? And if you said they were, you were a white supremacist, there was all that. And then some of our leading predators, like Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos and Mark Zuckerberg and Jamie Dimon and Mitt Romney were all in the streets saying Black Lives Matter, which, you know, kind of took my breath away. But they all evidently believe in, you know, inclusion and diversity and they love black people and that's just wonderful. So that happened in the summer of 2020. Then in January 6th of 2021, as many of you may have heard, we had an attempted coup in the Capitol. Did, did Iceland get that news? Right. So Hitler came back in the form of Donald Trump, and his supporters were, you know, reincarnations of the brown shirts, and they tried to take over the government of the United States by force, which uh, people actually believed, right? This was stunning to me. If you've done even the most minimal reading on what a, a coup attempt is, you could clearly see that this was not that. But that's what all the media was saying, and so that's what a whole lot of other people were saying, too. That was 2020. Moving into 2021, right? Then we had 2021, the year of the vaccine. And whereas people had been attacking anti-maskers as threats to public safety and neo-Nazis, now it was people who would not get vaccinated who were called anti-vaxxers, even if they weren't actually anti-vaxxers. And that went on through the year, right? And then as things started to ease up, seemingly, all of a sudden there was Russia slash Ukraine. And the exact same people who had been screaming against anti-maskers and then screaming against anti-vaxxers were now screaming about Russia and attacking anyone who raised the slightest question about the official narrative we were getting in the way that I was raising questions about the stories about Syria. It's exactly the same, it's no different. And indeed, the Russia-Ukraine propaganda is another direct replay of the propaganda in World War I. It's the same exact playbook, right? It works on people's fear and anger. It makes it rather dangerous to, uh, you know, not to join in, right? Uh, you're called names, you're accused of this and that. All right, now let me, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to want to take questions when I'm done. So I'm going to try to uh, bring this to a, to a conclusion by making some observations on the media. How is it that we live under this rolling thunder? How did this happen? I mean, the experience of living through World War I or living through the propaganda from the Allied governments uh, was powerful enough, it was compelling enough. It turned the wits of millions of people who found themselves signing up for a war that they didn't understand in expectation of an experience on the battlefield that was nothing like the reality because this was a war in which for the first time they used poison gas, they used landmines, they used tanks, they used barbed wire. It was also the first war in which they used the modern practice of propaganda. So a whole range of atrocious innovations were used in that war, which made the actual experience of fighting in it a living nightmare and uh, a continental trauma from which we still have not recovered. Because the shock and the horror of World War I contributed directly to the rise of Bolshevism and fascism, and we're, you know, we're still contending with the consequences of it. But the propaganda succeeded in hypnotizing enough people, not just to uh, acquiesce in it, but to join, to sign on, right? To turn against anyone who had questions or hesitated. You may know that um, <coughs> sauerkraut, right? German sauerkraut, was renamed Victory Cabbage in the United States, right? Because sauerkraut's too German. See? And when the United States invaded Iraq in 2003 and the, the French were resisting the rush to war and raising questions about it, uh, Congress uh, changed the name of uh, for French fries 
to freedom fries. <laughs> you know this? So now you can't get a Moscow mule in, in this uh, restaurant in uh, Reykjavik because they had to change the name of that to <laughs> Kiev. The Kiev. No, no, vodka. Oh, just vodka. Okay. So, all right. Uh, we're all doing our bit for the war. <laughs> well, all right. How did this happen? Well, you know, that's a very complicated question. I could never hope to answer it adequately in the space I'm given here today. But um, I will say that the media uh, uh, machine that now operates worldwide, this kind of global media machine, has been unified to an unprecedented extent, which makes this kind of propaganda generation uh, much easier. Since the 60s, uh, the Western media has been gradually combining uh, under the influence of corporate concentration so that at the moment five multinational corporations are responsible for something like 90 percent of all the content people take in. That wasn't the case in World War I, you know. Uh, there were no, uh, you know, media corporations of that size in existence then. So it's not, you know, essential that we have that uh, uh, factor in play. But we, we certainly have it now. The media is all basically one thing, and they're all pumping out exactly the same stories. They are all um, uh, enthralled to their corporate owners and to their major advertisers. Okay? And that's been the problem with commercial media since the 19th century. That, that when you are dependent on advertising revenues to maintain your media operation, you have basically Seated, you have given up your um, your press freedom because he who pays the piper calls the tune, and whoever uh, generates that revenue for you, right, that entity has the right to object to anything you may say in your news columns. Now, this first started in the late 19th century. Nobody knows this part of the story, and into the 20th century because of the um, patent medicine industry. Patent medicines were basically snake oil. These are, you know, curatives that, that were, there's nothing scientific about them. Their development was, you know, not in any way well informed. Uh, for the most part, they were uh, useless. Many of them were toxic. And a significant number of them were addictive. So there were all kinds of powders for lung conditions. In the 19th century, a lot of Americans seemed to suffer from catarrh, which is a sort of phlegmy condition. And they were all taking these catarrh powders that were full of cocaine. <laughs> okay? So there was actually a cocaine crisis in the United States in the 19th century, whose victims were mainly middle and upper middle class. You know, lawyers with good jobs were cokeheads because they had basically fallen for the advertising, and crucially, because not a single press outlet in the United States did any kind of investigation of these products. The press was mute because they depended on that mind. See? There were also products that were full of morphine, there were products that had alcohol in them, so these nice women who were temperance activists, you know, the Women's Christian Temperance Union, they were against drinking, they were falling down drunk. They were alcoholics because they were taking these medicines. See? It wasn't until 1905 that an investigative reporter named Samuel Hopkins Adams was asked by Collier's Magazine, an independent magazine, a magazine that took patent medicine advertising, right? But whose editor had a kind of journalistic conscience. He asked Adams to write a big expose of this, and he did. It's called The Great American Fraud. And he goes through all the claims for these medicines. He shows how poisonous, how addictive they are. And in the second half of his piece, he engages in a kind of brilliant media analysis where he shows how all these magazines and newspapers completely failed to do their due diligence and reveal to the readership in the United States that this stuff was actually useless, poisonous, 
and or addictive. And it was directly related to their dependence on those revenues. The same thing happened with cigarette advertising starting in the 20s. Through the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, into the 70s, our free press didn't report any of the breaking medical news about the risks of smoking. Okay? Today it's Pfizer. <laughs> Pfizer advertises everywhere. Pfizer is the lead advertiser for all the major news outlets on TV, brought to you by Pfizer. Is it a mystery then that none of them have reported honestly on, for example, the risks in the Pfizer vaccine? It is not a mystery. It's a very, very old story. So we have a certain continuity from the early days of commercial media, because the media still depends on its advertisers and their revenues. It still does that. It still fails to report honestly on the products made by those advertisers. We also now have Bill Gates, who has a number of what he calls strategic media partners. This is the New York Times. This is um, The Guardian. This is the BBC. Bill Gates has spent over $300 million on these partnerships, which you know, simply augment the effect of those advertisers. They strengthen the hold that those interests have on the media. And as the media has become more concentrated in its corporate structure, and uh, you know, more dependent on, or, or as dependent as ever, on its advertisers and its corporate owners, so has the media, especially since World War II, moved ever closer to what we call the deep state. Relations between the media and the intelligence agencies in different countries have tightened, see? So that it's not just an economistic, uh, uh, the explanation can't be just economistic. It's not just a matter of he who pays the piper calls the tune but there's also another relationship that we have to bear in mind, which is the relationship, the covert relationship, between the media and the state. And now that we're, again, dealing with a, a global situation, we're dealing with a range of globalist interests, we have to, you know, uh, take even greater pains to understand what it is that makes the media act as it does. Now, there's a poignant uh, addendum to the story of Samuel Hopkins Adams, who was a heroic journalist in that struggle. Uh, in 1911, the Supreme Court of the United States determined that claims in advertising do not amount to fraud. The only way in which you could argue that there's any fraud involved in the advertising patent medicines had to do with their ingredients. So Adams, who was indomitable, sprang back into action. He wrote another piece, you know, uh, six years after the first one, returning to that struggle and pointing out that, you know, the claims are just as important as the ingredients, probably more important. But then, sadly enough, when World War I rolled around, Samuel Hopkins Adams signed on as a propagandist in that struggle. He was completely convinced that the stories about Germany were true, and he devoted himself to doing propaganda work for the US government as wholeheartedly as he had devoted himself to exposing the lies of the media and the patent medicine industry. So this is a very sobering discovery that I'm describing to you. The people who really get it on some issues can completely collapse in the face of a propaganda drive that comes along subsequently if that drive hits people hard enough at a deep enough level. And I think it's safe to say that the COVID propaganda is probably the most successful ever at fear-mongering because the Huns or Islamic terrorists or communists, you know, whatever propaganda target you want to mention from the past, none of them has proven to be as deeply and disorientingly terrifying as the virus. That has made people, uh, even extremely intelligent people, cease to think critically. And that poses significant risks for the survival of democracy, 
it poses significant risks for the practice of science, and it poses significant risks for the rule of law. So what we're talking about here, this is not some arcane media studies uh, concern, right? The study of propaganda is an urgent matter. I believe it should be taught in every high school and college in the world. I think that people need to understand how the media works and they need to understand what propaganda is. So I'm going to conclude by offering a kind of rough set of criteria by which we can conclude that we're facing propaganda, that it's not just information. If a story, a particular narrative, is inescapable, you cannot not see it or hear it. It is trumpeted by every media outlet out there, and then some. And you're hearing the propaganda not only throughout the press, but you're hearing it when you're on hold calling the pharmacy. <laughs> you're seeing it along the roadside, you know, as you're driving your car. Wearing is caring. I remember that pro mask ad. It was alongside the highways in the United States. So if, if, it, if it's inescapable, if you cannot get away from it, the chances are that that did not happen organically. Okay, that requires a certain amount of orchestration. Right? Then, if there is not a peep of contradiction, if nobody is suggesting, maybe this isn't the whole story. Maybe there's another side to the story. There is nothing like that. It is all missing. And on top of that, if anyone who does argue the other side of the story is mentioned in a withering and contemptuous way and called names, then I promise you, you are dealing with propaganda. Because propaganda, this is important, it does not ever want an argument. It's different from persuasion. And people often say mass persuasion as if that's what propaganda is. It's not. Persuasion is a process that involves some back and forth between two sides. I mean, we think of the orators in ancient Greece or ancient Rome, they were engaged in mass persuasion. Each speaker had a particular argument to make, knowing that there were others around him who were making different arguments, and it was a kind of a contest. It was an oratorical contest. And the audience, the demos, the people, would listen, ideally use their reason, and decide which speaker made the most compelling case. Okay? That's the process of persuasion. Propaganda does not want to persuade anybody. Propaganda wants to present one narrative, and they want you to know only of that narrative. They don't want you even to know there is another narrative. See? And that is why they'll call people conspiracy theorists, or anti-vaxxers, or Russian trolls, or whatever name they use. The fact is that that name-calling serves the purpose of ensuring that you will not even bother to listen to the other side because you're too pissed off. This guy's crazy. This guy's nuts. Forget him, right? And then you react the way my friend, the philosophy professor, acted five years ago. <laughs> he wanted me to, sh to shut up. He wanted to shut me up, right? Luckily, I, I didn't. But... Um, the fact is that, that, that we're living in a moment which ought to teach us that propaganda uh, poses a profound existential threat to everything that we hold dear. What's sobering about this kind of study is the discovery that mankind seems not to have progressed a centimeter <laughs> throughout the sweep of human history, okay? People are falling for the Russian-Ukraine propaganda as hard as they fell for the anti-German propaganda. But I would go even further than that and say that, uh, you know, the people who are ready to string you up today as an anti-vaxxer or a Russian troll are no different from the people who are looking for witches to burn in the 16th century in Europe. There is a kind of wellspring of aggression in humankind 
and propagandists know how to appeal to that. It is an unholy practice. I believe it's a crime against humanity. And we are obliged, uh, you know, while waiting for the tribunals, which may never take place, you know, the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions that we will need to have someday. While we're waiting for that, we have to begin the necessary process of studying propaganda, studying it impartially, studying it even though one's impartial study will probably move one out of one's comfort zone. You will discover that certain things you believed ardently are false. I've had this experience, I continue to have this experience, smart as I am, right? <laughs> you study propaganda, you realize you've been had. And professionals, academics, journalists have to face the fact that, yeah, they can be fooled too. Maybe they can be fooled more than average people, right? So that's my message to you all. I'm um, delighted to be here in Iceland, and I thought I would conclude by reading um, a couple of verses from the Elder Edda, which uh, my wife and I are reading in honor of Iceland. And I found a couple of verses that I thought were appropriate to include at the end of my talk. No man ought to boast about his brains, but rather beware with his wits. When one sensible and silent comes to the house, seldom wrong befalls the wary. No man ever had a friend more faithful than a good store of common sense. The wary guest who comes to dine stays silent, but strains his ears. All smart men find things out for themselves. Okay? All smart men find things out for themselves. Okay? That's the takeaway today. <laughs> you study the evidence yourself. You make up your own mind about it. And you do not let the state or the globalists or the media or all of them together tell you what's true. You think about it. Thank you. <laughs>